Can you tell me a bit about you and your family? I'm a single mom. I was living in Georgia and then I moved back home to Boston for my family to help with my daughter. So it's pretty much me, my daughter, and my mother, her grandmother. How well do you feel like you understand your child? <laughs> <laughs> I feel I understand her about 50%. Meaning if we, if we just go off a of traditional, if she's in pain, if she's not feeling well or whatever, but I feel like there's so much more to her that I don't understand. Gotcha. And then sometimes things pop out and I'm like, wow, you know what I mean? That we didn't know she knew or things like that, which tells me there's a whole lot we don't know she knows. You know what I mean? Yeah. How do you communicate with each other? Um, with her, it's more gestures. She will use the speech device if forced, not physically forced, but if I'm like, use your words, like you're not going to get it unless you use your words, she will use the speech device. But to me, she's she's using it. A lot of things with autism is um, for like what they need or want, right? But it's, you know, it, when do you get past needs or wants and having a conversation with somebody? So I think it's really been impressed on her that the, the so far, and especially with COVID and everything, like she really hasn't had a speech therapist until recently, that we need to get past just the needs and wants and then have a conversation with me. Like, what are you thinking? What do you want to do? What do you, you know, do you like this book? You know, things like that, opposed to Cheddar Bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> do you experience people telling you that they know more about what your child needs than you do? And if so, how does that make you feel? Or what is your response to that? Well, I feel parenting is different for everybody. I don't care if they're neurotypical or not, right? But everybody got their opinions. And it depends who the person is with the opinion, right? Yeah. Like, do you see your opinion and, okay, I'm not vibing with it and we let it go or do you like push it? Like, but, but, but I had a lot, I being, she was my only child. So when I had her and I'm seeing these differences, like more experienced mothers were trying to tell me that I was crazy, that it's not that like, oh, you know, there's nothing wrong. Um, she'll grow out of it or whatever, like all these things. And I didn't know that I could go to early intervention. Like there were certain things I didn't know. Right. And then I got in an argument with her doctor because she kept, I said, she's still not talking. And you know, when they're babies, you go to the doctors a lot, like yeah. every three to four months or whatever. And she's like, Oh, it's a big range. Don't worry about it. And I was like, okay, so we come back four months and she's still not talking. I mean, I would have took a word or something, right? Yeah. <laughs> what got me was the, the reason I kept reinforcing it because, you know, now we're the app generation, right? Mm -hmm. So I had an app telling me what milestones she should hit after so many months, after you put in the birthday and it alerts you, she should be doing this or she should be doing that. And she wasn't doing none of it. And um, the doctor's like, well, you can call early intervention if you want to. I said, want to? Okay. So that's when I realized you didn't even really need a doctor to call early intervention. So I called and I got rid of that doctor and I got a new doctor. And um, this doctor was great. I didn't feel like a number. She sat down, she talked to me and she gave me those 18 questions. It's like the question, because she was like, she could be autistic. I was like, what? And she's like, well, you, I'm not saying she's autistic, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> just a regular pediatrician, right? She's like, but we should put her on the list to be tested, whatever. She gave me, I don't know, it's these 18 questions to see if your kid is autistic. Mm. And it, it was looking like it. And I was still convinced she wasn't, not that I knew anything. And then we go to the developmental pediatrician and within 20 minutes, she's like, yeah. <laughs> like, well, you know and there's a fear of it because you don't hear good things about autism like I mean if you put all the marketing and you know things you hear about autism it's never that good like I mean you might see the Cody Lee's on um America's Got Talent but other than that autism's on the rise and people don't know what to do and you know like it's always like that. It's never, and then when you realize 
that the spectrum is so big and so large that you have, so you, okay, you find out you have an autistic child, right? Okay, so you think there's a playbook for this. There's no playbook, okay? Because your kid's an individual, right? Yep. <laughs> and then even if you have a new friend who has an autism mom and your kids are the same age, it's like night and day, <laughs> night and day. So you have no playbook. So, but I mean, the, the problem I had was I felt, for lack of a better word, that they thought she was stupid. Like they would do things and she wouldn't, you know, do whatever they wanted her to do. So I had started taking it to an outside speech therapist, right? And me and the speech therapist started talking and we figured out that she was bored. Hmm. All right. You had these PEX cards that, okay, a year ago, maybe she was interested in doing, but a year later, she's like, I don't want to play these reindeer games with you <laughs> and I'm done. And you know, uh, what they had like toilet, go, like these little basic words. And my thing was, okay, so what, what do I have to go off? I'm going off what they say, right? She's not using them efficiently. Also, she has seizures. So how much is this seizures affecting her? Like, you know, it's hard to tell when they don't talk. So was it, she knew how to do it before, then she had a seizure, now she doesn't know how to do it type of thing. Like I couldn't really pinpoint it, right? right. So then she gets the speech device, right? And takes off like a mad woman with the speech device. And I love the speech therapist at the Autism Center ABA. They, they're the ones who really got her going right but the fact that that happened I knew that those pecs cards were so below her that mm -hmm. she just didn't want to do it and you know how do you advocate for that like how do you know that right like I had to have a situation where the speech device comes into play and I'm like what do you mean she knows 50 words on the speech device she can do flashcards she could do this and that but six months ago you had a thing around her neck with three pex cards and she wouldn't do it yeah right so i was like i'm no longer just accepting what people say you know what i mean like i'm no longer accepting um well when i first found out she was autistic my thing is and i've always learned and i don't know if you take if you're ever doing something find people doing the same thing find people in the same situation, the same, whatever. So me and a friend, my first autism mom friend started going to like autism events around Massachusetts, right? Some of them were real autism events and some of them weren't, but we were trying, right? Yeah. And I met this woman and she was saying, she said to me that, and they do always say this to meet them where they're at, meet mm -hmm. them where they're at. And she said, I don't want to meet my son where he's at. I want to meet him where he needs to go. And that's key because meaning where he's at could be setting the bar low to where you think he's at, yeah. right? Opposed to setting the bar high. And if they don't make it, fine, but you never know if they'll make it, right? Like you expectations, right? Mm -hmm. So I took that. Now, mind you, that happened when she was two. And I took that and I kept going with it. I want to meet her where she needs to go. If you set the bar high and she doesn't accomplish it, so what? You're still trying, right? So um, I just don't, so the school she's in now, and it is about enthusiasm too, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like you always got to take into play who's judging your child because some of them only want a success only mission. They want to look like they're the teacher, the superstar, the therapist, the superstar. She did this, this, and this. And I had to argue it's not a like, success only a mission. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not looking for ultimate success. I'm looking for progress. So that can mean not hitting the mark, but getting close to it. Not hitting the mark, but trying. You know what I mean? All those things go into play. Not, oh, yeah, she did it. Well, so what? Like, what's the next mark? Like, if she did it, what does she can do next? You know what I'm saying? So mm. I've, and I'm not a teacher. I try my best with my little stuff, but I am not a teacher. 
Um, and that's why I'm glad she's in school and her teacher is excited. That's yeah. another thing, enthusiastic hmm. or whatever. I was like, I think she can read. I think I can't prove it. I think she has beginning reading skills or she's reading. I'm not sure though. And she's like, yes, excited. There's, there's a, some kind of program for nonverbals to read. I was like, yes, you know, so her excitement makes me excited. You know what I mean? But I'll tell you this, before she got the speech device and she had her Kindle, you know, the kid's Kindle, you can pick Mm -hmm. everything you want. And I said, I think she likes space. You know what I mean? Because she was watching like deep space, nine second generation. And, you know, we're going to these space things. And I said, I think she likes um, dinosaurs or whatever. And this is just me watching her use her speech device. And I was told, um, she probably just likes the colors. What? Right. So then she gets the speech designs and they come back. Oh, she likes space and dinosaurs. I said, I told you that last year. You know what I mean? Like, so it's always this battle. There a lot, not all, but a lot of therapists want to assume they know better. Mm. But it's also parents too, because there are those outlandish parents of the realistic parents too. And I had to get over that, like my expectation. I cannot go into this with any expectation because I will get my feelings hurt every time. I have to go in with a plan, how we're gonna do this, what we need to work towards. But if I went into this with expectations, like when she was two, I swore you couldn't tell me she wasn't gonna talk by the time she's seven, she's not talking. But do you see what I'm saying? Like I had to quash all those expectations. Um, what resources have you found most useful um, over time in learning about autism and your and your child? I can't say because they don't offer you much. Mm. You get early intervention. You might you get the same little speech OT or whatever. But this is this is the thing too because I get a lot of battles on like social media about ABA, right? Mm. A lot of battles. What's the alternative? There isn't one. There's, there's not like some place, school, alternative, different something that I'm saying no to, to say yes to ABA, right? It's, it's like, I'm like when they argue with you and I'm like, but my child won't feed herself. She won't do basic things. We're not even talking about neurotypical crap, right? We're talking about survival skills for me not to like feed herself or you know and there's more that goes into that because she eats like four things but when she refused to feed herself when she refused to go to the bathroom like where do those skills come into play right and if it's not ABA then who and I'm not equipped who's supposed to do this like what's the like they argue with you like there's a list of 10 things and you pick one and avoided the rest. There was no other option. Not one. Not where I live. I don't know where they live, but not one. And um, now I do, uh, for me, I mean, uh, another autistic mom we're talking about. We feel that ABA is for the moderate to severe. Not more the high function. You know what I mean? The high function, I think, you could do that at home. You know what I mean? You don't need the whatever. But even though I'm not the superstar of ABA, I see its point. You know what I mean? Like I had issues, but I feel I would have had issues regardless, like because I pay attention. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I want to know what's going on. Me and th- her first ABA therapist. Now, first of all, social service is, is not the most pristine um, job thing. First, they get people fresh out of college because it doesn't pay. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you're not getting, (laughs) and I'm not saying they were bad because they were fresh out of college, but I'm saying though, the turnover is high. Mm -hmm. I mean, they come in and out so quickly. Some were better than others. You know what I mean? Um, But I also feel that the first ABA therapist I said to him, or BCBA, well, what are her issues? She doesn't have any issues. I said, okay, 
that ain't a productive conversation. <laughs> okay. I said, if she had no issues, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be dropping her off for 40 hours a week. Tell me what she's struggling with. You know what I mean? What is it? You know, don't act like it's rainbows and butterflies. I live with this. It ain't rainbows and butterflies, you know? And he's like, it takes her a long time to learn something. But once she learns it, she knows it. I said, see, that's a productive conversation. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm not the parent that want to hear all the good shit. Okay. (laughs) I don't want you to tell me I have superstar kid, whatever. Be real. Tell me what's really going on. And hence how the whole homeschooling started. This is how it started. They said, because ABA therapists work according to your health insurance paying. Mm. They're not a school. It's not a school. So if they, it's not a curriculum, it's not an IEP. It's not, she needs to know this by this time. It's all behavioral, right? Mm -hmm. They do work on some educational stuff, but it's not school. Right. So they said she knew her colors and now she doesn't know her colors. I said, what? (laughs) So I was like, okay, fine. I started working on her color and I did it five different ways. So we are clear that she knows her colors. (laughs) I did it. Can you put the color here? Can you point out the color? Where's the color in this book? you know, like five different ways, not just because my daughter is a manipulator. I love her, but she is. And she knows how to act smart people. We mm-hmm. realize, right? When they put this up, they always want me to touch that. Do I know what that is? No, but I know they always want me to touch that. So she would go out her way and it's funny because that's how I was in college like figure out more ways to not do the work than do the work right and they would be like oh she knows her colors but they weren't like flipping it up it was like probably the same test over and over she done mastered this test and you don't know that she doesn't know shit you just she mastered your test or whatever so when I was teaching her I think she fundamentally knew her colors but she wasn't tested on, okay, I'm not giving you the same test over and over. I'm going to move this around. And we're going to see if you come up with this color. You know what I mean? And after two weeks, she knew her colors. You know what I mean? And that's when I was like, with her being in this autism center, I'm going to have to fill in the blank. I'm going to have to. And I still feel like if I had some educational skills, which I have none, that I would be further along with this. But now she's in school and I'm praying they don't send them back home because COVID, but now she's in school and um, I'm more hopeful. I'm still working on my part because they still tell me what she's struggling with. So I'm trying. And then people, I get bashed on social media. Like you're abusing her, you're exploiting her, you're doing this and that. And I'm like, it's 20 minutes, three times a week. We are not sitting here for hours. I work a full-time job. And she comes home, it is literally 20 minutes. And then I edit that down to two minutes. And they're like, <laughs> she's, she's not happy. And that's another thing. Kids aren't always happy. Like, I don't get that. Like, it, um, I don't know what kid wants to sit and do homework. Like, neurotypical or not, right? And they're like, well, she seems sad. She wants her iPad. She wants the iPad, uninterrupted iPad time. And I'm interrupting iPad time. So she is not happy about it, yeah. you know? You know, and I don't know, <laughs> most artistic parents know about iPad time, you know? iPad time is not to be messed with or they are not in a good mood, Okay. And the fact that she's willing to sit there and do it with me, it's not running off. It's not like I could chase her around the whole house and drag her to the seat to make her do this. Like she has to have some form of participation. Right. So, but some people beat me up. Do you feel as though you are your child's voice and why or why not? I feel I am, but I wish I wasn't. Like, I wish I knew what she wanted opposed to, 
uh, definitely parent, I would have been her voice regardless, like with school or whatever. But she has seizures, so she has to give blood. And I know she doesn't want to do it. And I, instead of just holding her down to get the blood, you know, which we have to do, I wish I could have a conversation with her to say, well, we're doing this because of this, mm-hmm. you know, it's going to be unpleasant or, but mommy will be right here. We're not having these conversations. So I feel like a villain here, you know, in, um, in certain situations that I have to do, you know, like we have to go to the dentist. You know, mm-hmm. you're not going to want to go to the dentist, but who does want to go to the dentist? But the point too, I don't know if your teeth hurt. You can't tell me if you're in pain. So that was one of the reasons I was like, we need to go to the dentist. You know what I mean? Because if something's bothering her, she doesn't come and say something's bothering her or my mouth hurts or whatever. So And, you know, with the seizures, that's another thing, like in the medical field, if your child's autistic, oh, well, she has seizures. Oh, well, so many kids with autism have seizures. And that's like the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's your explanation for everything. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Right. So just accept it because, well, can we find out what it is? And (laughs) no, you know, it's so... I, to be honest, got doctors this guess. I learned that years ago, but the, the still, it's, it's not accommodating that you just say, oh, it's the autism. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Can it be more than that? Can it be something else? Oh, it could be. But because she's autistic, that's what it is. Yeah. So I am her voice. I would rather she be her own voice, you know, but. <laughs> to be honest, I don't know one parent of a nonverbal child that didn't wish their child off. Yeah. Like I went to the Doug Flutie Foundation um, gala. No, her son's 27, or 20, mm-hmm. in his 20s, right? And she said she was going over her speech, and these were the most down to earth people. I ended up talking to his wife and all this and that. And you know who Doug Flutie is, right? Okay, he's an NF, a retired NFL player, big in Massachusetts. Very cool. Right. And his son is older in his 20s. So he started a foundation for autism like 20 years ago. Oh, wow. And they do a gala or whatever every year. Even though they live in Florida, they come back to Massachusetts, do the gala, and, you know, invite his, um, you know, rich people and they <laughs> pledge or whatever. But the thing is, like, it goes to the people, like, they're giving out mm-hmm. iPads and they're giving, you know, they're helping. Like, it's very, it's not one of these, I hate to say it, kind of autism speak situation. Yeah. Like, they're really hitting the ground running and helping people or whatever, like, with needs and stuff. So, um, she did a speech and basically said, he said, mom, or something to that effect, right? Now, mind you, he's in his 20s. But she was so, happy like she was so ecstatic and I felt that you know I felt that and that's when I went up and talked to her you know thinking oh my god these are like famous people right (laughs) and I go up and talk to her and she talked to me too it it was very nice you know what I'm saying Mm -hmm. but I don't know a parent of any nonverbal child that don't want them to talk Mm -hmm. you know it, not even to make life easier, just to have a conversation with your child. And there's a little selfishness into it. You want to hear the word mom too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel regarding the role of autistic advocates in the world of autism? <clears throat> I think it depends what they're advocating for. Meaning, I didn't, you know, I don't necessarily have an issue with autism speech. I ain't use them that much, right? But I see the cure pushed a lot and I hate to say it would people if they if a cure actually existed would people take it I think a a lot of parents would click that button and the reason I say that is because think of deaf kids right cochlear I dated somebody who was deaf over 20 years ago cochlear implants just came out right Mm -hmm. it wasn't a common thing but I asked him 
if you know, if you could hear, would you want to? He said, no, I'm deaf. Because he had meningitis at two. So he'd been mm. pretty much deaf since a child. So it's not like he could hear him and was deaf. But if you would have asked his mother, she would have said, cochlear implant. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So <laughs> it's like, would a parent, I, I don't think if a cure existed, if you did a poll on parents, what parents would say opposed to the autistic child would say. Mm -hmm. And for different reasons too, different yeah. reasons. I feel there's a lot of shitty parents out there, neurotypical or autistic. There's a lot of shitty parents, right? And they'd want their life easier, period. I'm sorry, they just would. <laughs> I, it is what it is, right? Yeah. We wouldn't have a foster care system modest if there wasn't a whole group of shitty ass parents. Yeah. Some parents, you could feel their pain because their child's severe and they are dealing with a lot. So if they could flick a button and not deal with that or give them some juice or whatever the hell snake oil they trying to pimp these days, you know, yeah. they would fuck it. You know, me personally, I don't mind that my child's autistic. I just wish she talked. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if she, cause you know, the developmental pediatrician told me if she functionally talked, she might be delayed, but not as delayed, you know? And I, to be honest, I don't mind the quirks. I don't mind all that. I, I just wish she talked. Mm -hmm. that, that's my thing. But I feel like parents are all over the place. So when you say advocate, the first advocate is the parent, right? As I said, there's a lot of shitty ass parents. So they're not really always advocating for their kids either. Like I've talked to people and they had the IP, right? And I'd be like, oh, well, how'd it go? Oh, you know, I listened. Blah, blah. Well, what did they say? And, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, what did you say? Oh, I just, you know, there was no response, no back and forth, no whatever. They just accepted what these people said about your kids, their, their child. And I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> did they meet the goals? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like that's not because come to find out in certain situations they just copy and paste the goals from last year and copy it this year how do you know that if you didn't look at last year's to this year and you just go into this meeting like eh, i don't really feel like being here i'll just listen and sign whatever you know what i'm saying yeah. or so there's also this nonverbal child as a friend of a friend and um he has words though and I'm like, okay, but he has words. Like, why aren't y'all building off the fact that this boy has words? I mean, he ain't got a thousand words, but he got about 25, right? And the somebody sent home got he was intellectually disabled. Okay, me, I had an argument with uh, a, a group of people about this. Intellectual disability is a medical diagnosis. Who are you to say that my child's intellectually disabled? And if you say that, what's your proof, right? Mm -hmm. And instead, you know, she was just upset, whatever, whatever. And I'm sitting there like, no, you know, I would have been in their face like, okay, school or whatever. Are you going to pay for a neuropsych to prove your backup, which is a $5,000 test? You know what I mean? Which is in your right. Because they're the one that struck the horn first. They're the one saying that your child's intellectually disabled. See, that's what people don't realize. So you don't, you know, now I'm not going to my doctor for nothing. You said it, you prove it. Hmm. You know what I mean? Or whatever. So some parents are not the best advocates. And you got to think we all got different personalities, just like a autistic. You know, some people are not combative or whatever. I'm not combative, but I can be. You know what I mean? And when it comes to my child, I very well can be. So uh, there was the, I'll give you an example. So there's a program that buses children um, to suburban schools for a better education in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. I won't say the program, but if you're from here, you know what I'm talking about. And I go to the meeting because I'm, I'm on the alum of that program. Mm -hmm. I graduated from suburban school. I live in the city, whatever. And I go to the meeting and I'm like, well, do you take disabled children? And they're like, they give me this, 
disability does not re denote a rejection. But okay. Well, do you have transportation? No. We can barely afford the transportation we have. So there goes the rejection, right? So at first I wasn't going to fight it. It was the autism mom crew that was like, no, you need to fight it. Blah, 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 blah. That's wrong. That's bad. You know? And I was like, okay, well, how do I fight it? It's a lottery. You got to think outside the box, right? It's a lottery. They could just say she didn't make the lottery, right? What I did, my aunt, this is how it happened because I'm talking to my aunt about it. And she was like, well, go to the public record. Mm -hmm. There you go. Because this program been in existence a long damn time. So I go to the public record and I put in a public information request. How many disabled, well, at first I said autistic kids have been in this program in the, the, the stretch of how long it's been in existence. They say 12. They came back 12. And then I started thinking, well, 12, they could all have been high function. I'm like, that doesn't mean anything. So I went back and labeled like 12 disability, like mm. you know, palsy, Down syndrome, whatever, whatever. And at the time they were like, who is this? <laughs> like they were like, you could tell the wheels were churning. Who is this person? And this is why you need an autism mom crew. So one of the autism moms has two autistic boys, is a lawyer. And we're friends. And she wrote me a letter and told me just the sign <laughs> and had all the statutes and everything. And now they're really scared, like, mm. right? So then I had to go back to the Department of Education and put in a complaint. And it went on for a year. It went on for a year and they would not accept that they were being, um, what is it? They were discriminating. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't accept it. They were like go bending over backwards to say they were not, right? But during this year, I done complained to everybody in their mama, like the attorney general, the commission of discrimination. I like getting no help here, but mm -hmm. I'm complaining all over the place, right? Um, it, it got to the point that one of the people at the Department of Education was like, she emails everybody in her emails. She even um, has the governor's email on there. And I would, I have 30, 40 email, I email blast everybody, right? And um, this is when I had a state senator's assist aide was calling, cause I was calling state senator, mm -hmm. our houseman, whatever. And she was like, well, she has the right to put whoever she wants in her email. <laughs> right? like, <laughs> told me what happened, right? So, they were sticking to it, Stephanie. They were sticking to it to the last hurrah because it was supposed to take them 60 days to mm -hmm. give me an answer. Over 100 days, I did not have one. And it was going back and forth to legal. Do you hear this? Back and mm -hmm. forth to legal. They're trying to figure out. So... Uh, I put in a, I started complaining to everybody about that. It was supposed to be 60 days. Why is it taking you over 60 days, right? And then they motioned against me. They disagreed, right? And they had some little legal whatever. The attorney general swoops in. <laughs> or the attorney general's office. Mm -hmm which I literally only got this woman on the phone one time and could never get on the phone again, whatever. She swoops in and tells them they're breaking the law. <laughs> now, the reason they really couldn't help me is because I guess they're both state agencies and they can't really fight each other type of thing. But essentially I have a lawsuit, right? This whole time I'm looking for a lawyer or nobody's taking my, like, I don't have any money. Like, if I have money, that'd be different. So she swoops in, a woman from the civil rights department of the attorney general's office from Massachusetts, tells them they're breaking the law. Now everything turns on a dime. Now they want to work with me. Now they want to go over policies and procedures. And one of the schools that rejected her took her. Mm. Now, I don't blame the school, like the people who work in the school, because they're not the one making these choices. Yeah. But, and they are great. But I'm just saying, like, 
you know, I work a full-time job. I had to call on my lunch break before mm-hmm. work during this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> it was a mess. It was literally a mess. And it was a lot of extra on my part, which a lot of people, I, I wanted to quit several times because it was so much, yeah. you know what I mean? Especially when this ain't your job. Like some people like advocates and I say job, like yeah. this is not my job. I'm just fighting. And I feel like the only reason I got the furthest, because during all this, I found where the bodies were buried. I was not the first person to do this. Mm-hmm. I was not the first mother, but the difference where they were fighting for their kid, you won't let my kid in. And they had sibling preference. So if you had an older child and they were in, you would assume you're younger. And once they found out those kids had special needs, they weren't letting them in. Now it's not guaranteed that the second kid gets in, but it's suspicious that the second kid didn't get in, right? Yeah. I feel I got the furthest because I didn't fight for Ava. I said, would you let any kid? Right? Mm-hmm. Making it, you need to prove to me you let any of these kids in, not yeah. mine, any. And that's how it went. So advocacy can be hard. I noticed in the Southern states, they care less. Mm. So the money is not there. There's more money. I mean, it's hard to get services everywhere, but you can tell it's easier in Massachusetts as opposed to Alabama. Yeah. You know, and that's just talking to parents online. Like certain things like in Florida, you need a medical waiver. You get on some long ass lottery list. Like, you know, there's no waiver here. Mm -hmm. You're on the list. You know, you got a diagnosis you're on the list. You don't have to wait seven years to get on a list, you know? Yeah. So it, it, it's just, it's disheartening. Like, like do, do people in the South don't care until it affects them? You know what I mean? Like, cause you know, a lot of it, you got to worry about other people. You know what I mean? Like other people, like I didn't know anything about autism or anything. I mean, I had a few cousins, but until it hit me on on my own and the things I have to do in the bureaucracy regardless the the money's there can be disheartening but Mm -hmm. at least it's there (laughs) you know at least you can sit on the phone and get it done and not have to wait seven years or five years to get your child some services or get you some respite or something because you're going crazy you know what I mean like Mm -hmm. I don't know so I don't know I, I think it depends on what they're fighting for if they're fighting for their own recognition, then they're useless. But if they're in the trenches and they're helping a mom get through an IEP or helping the child get some services or that they need or helping or whatever, are realizing that not all parents are the same. Like, are they taking some of them out of abusive households? Because nonverbal kids are especially are the easiest fix. Yeah. What do you think about the conversation around who gets to speak or advocate for non-speaking autistic people? Hard to say, as you you know, because everybody comes from their own personal perspective. Mm-hmm. So I feel there's a divide between autistic people and everybody else. And I feel like, as I say, it's a lot of shitty marriage. Like, and you can't say, and then the parents, I hate to say it, want their recognition too, meaning this child didn't just become successful because they just showed up that way. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. and I'm the one who's always looking for what actually happened. So you saw Cody Lee, he wins America's Got Talent, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I want to see an interview with his mother. And I found an interview with his mother. And his mother was basically like, this took a lot from our family to do this. Like a lot of work, a lot of therapy, a lot of music teachers, a lot, a whole lot, a lot. And then later I found another interview where she says, oh yeah, he can do this, but he's still blind and autistic. And he can, and he can be easily manipulated and taken advantage of. Yeah. And I feel that leads, I feel like that, you know, even higher function, let's flip it, right? 
higher functioning just because you kind of fit in the norm, normal, quote unquote, world still needs services. And that's why they took um, Asperger's out the DSM-1 because you, you might can function in the world, but maybe you don't have the wherewithal to pay bills or get a job or whatever. And you need services too. I don't care that they think you look exactly the same and act similar enough to get by. You still might need something, you know? Mm-hmm. And once they took the autonomy of you being on autom- well, you're Asperger's, like then the help went away too. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That it doesn't matter if you're quirky or whatever, but can you function in the world by yourself? And if you can't, then what can we do for you, you know, to help you do that, right? And, but once they put that to vibe, well, I'm autistic in their aspect. So they don't need any help. See, the, see, that's the flip side of it. You don't know that, you know what I mean? Like um, my cousins, uh, like, you know, a black boy who's autistic, who's high functioning, but doesn't understand social cues could get him killed yeah could get him killed so you gotta you gotta put all that into play he looks normal but doesn't understand why i need to comply to you because he don't get that he don't understand that you know what i'm saying but that's what i'm saying so it's you know everybody wants to and also what do you do as a parent you know as a parent of severe children eventually you're going to die, right? Mm -hmm. Probably for your kid. And a lot of the fear is, well, who's going to take care of these kids once I'm gone, you know? And I understand how autistic people are like, well, you're saying we're bad and you're saying we're this or that. And I'm like, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying reality dictates that not every autistic is the same. So maybe you can get through life and this child can't. Well, what are you saying about the child who can't and the parent who's worried about the child who can't? You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? I'm not trying to take anything from you because you can, but I have this child right here who can't. And what am I supposed to do with that? Or I have a child that's getting constantly kicked out of school and I'm about to not have a job because I have nowhere to put this child. Like I had a discussion with my boss about, I can't drop my nonverbal child at the Boys and Girls Club. I can't drop her places that traditional childcare situation. You know what I mean? So that's a reality of a parent. Now, for an autistic adult or whoever to come and say, but you're blaming your child. I'm not blaming her. It's a reality of the situation. But don't look at me in my struggles and poo-poo that because you're autistic and I should be, you know, (laughs) I'm sorry. It's not always a great thing, like, for people. It's not. I'm not saying it's an ultimate bad thing. And people deal with a whole host of special needs with their children. But I don't feel, because it's such a spectrum to the high, to the low, right? Mm -hmm. That you get the higher people arguing with you about how you feel about it or whatever. Everybody's going to feel different, right? But let's say I don't hear the same drama from people that have cerebral palsy. Like the parents and the kids and the different levels of cerebral palsy ain't arguing with each other, who got it worse and who should be right and who should be wrong and you know how somebody should feel about it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. My thing is everybody's gonna feel different. Just like autistics are different, every person is different. They're gonna feel different about it. But as a parent, we're also gonna feel different about it as a parent. You know what I mean? Difference, like a deaf parent by Coda, right? Mm -hmm. So Coda is children of deaf parents, right? Right. And some of them kids are deaf. So a child who's also deaf and their parent is deaf is going to have a different experience than a child if their parent is deaf 
and the child is hearing, it's going to have a different experience if the parents can hear and the child is deaf. It's going to be all different and they're going to go through different roles. Or the parent whose child is deaf and they don't want them to be deaf. So they force them to get a cochlear implant that they don't want. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So it, it, there's too many scenarios to decide who's right and who's wrong. Yeah. Right? Everybody has the autonomy to raise their children whatever way they want to, as long as they're not beating the brakes off them or starving them or whatever, right? Yeah. But I mean, if you listen in the news, there's so many horrific stories of what happens to autistic children by p- abusive parents. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there was this one in New York. Um, and I really felt the mama didn't get hurt just because she was an immigrant and he was a police officer. Mm-hmm. And he was abusing the children, right? Making them sleep in the garage. And then one died in the garage. And that's when it came to light. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? But this woman had been fighting for her kids for years. Do you see what I'm saying? But because he was a police officer, right? Yeah. He got, you know, over. So that's what I'm saying. Reality doesn't always fit in a perfect box. You know, maybe if he was just Joe Schmo Postman, she would have got somewhere. But the fact that he was a police officer, he didn't, they didn't get too far. And the school was calling too. It wasn't even just her. Right. But do you see what I'm saying? Like reality and the way we wish it was, it's two different things. Yeah. And I can't claim an opinion because everybody has a different one, you know? I mean, I feel that none of my videos are abusive, but I get people coming at me like, oh my God, she doesn't look happy, you know? And they don't know that when they send everybody home and I had to do Zoom with her from home, home's playing to her. So she didn't want to do Zoom, Okay. So it was two weeks of crying, two weeks of crying, which I did not put on the internet, mm-hmm. but two weeks of crying before she sat down and realized we're going to do this. You know, I had no choice. You know, you can't even go to therapy, nothing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I just feel like I am not abusing this child in any way that I am of knowledge of now. And, uh, but everybody has a difference of opinion and some I disagree with, some I do, but that's just my opinion, you know? Yeah. And did you have any other um, thoughts or anything that you'd like to share? The first thing I I would say to autistic parents, because that's the only facet I can speak to, you know, I'm not autistic myself that I know of, um, is now we have social media, we have Facebook, we have all this. If you get an autism diagnosis tomorrow, you need to go on there and find local Facebook groups. The big ones are nice, but local and start asking questions because they they send you out of the doctor's office with a little packet, right? And you don't know what the hell to do next. And start asking questions about what to apply for, what do I need to do, what do you do, what did you do with your child at two, you know what I'm saying? To give you some options. Because until I started meeting people locally, I didn't have no options because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what the options were. And um, the whole ABA to not ABA, I have no opinion on that too. My thing is whatever works for your kid is what works for your kid. Whatever you choose to put your child in, you choose to put your child in. I mean, you, you, I mean, not to be funny, I mean, there's teachers that abuse autistic kids too. It's not just the ABA clinics or whatever. And um, there was a case here where the teacher was abusing the nonverbal kids in her classroom or whatever. So, I mean, you just got to watch out, period. But I can't say that ABA fits your child. All our children are different. You know what I mean? I say... To be honest, I don't take advice. Put her in there, put him or her in there, see what happens. And you always have the right to change your mind. If it's not working, if it, if something doesn't smell right or whatever, take them out. But I wouldn't go off of my experience to placate your experience because you could be losing out. I mean, 
if you're in a different place, you're going to have a whole he's a different therapist and everything else. So my thing is try it. If you don't like it, take them out. I said, nobody's holding you to the fire that you got to keep your kid in there. But, it's, you know, ask a lot of questions, go to all the little parent meetings, um, because that was another thing like um, me and, you know, the autism center kind of had an issue. And then I had parent meetings every two weeks and I always went, I always asked questions. I wanted proof. That's another thing, proof. Don't tell me she can do something. Take a video, show me she can do it. Why can't I get her to do it at home? Cause it, it, it doesn't, I get the whole dog trick thing, right? But if it generalizes at home, it's not a dog trick, right? It's not, cause my daughter had a therapist she loved, loved her. They could, she could, he could convince her to do anything because she was so infatuated with him. That's nice. You need to bring somebody else over here and try to get her to do it. I don't want, because she got goo goo eyes for the therapist that she's willing to do what he says, but not anybody else, you know? <laughs> so like, if they say like, even now they said, she would run away from the swing like she was scared of it. And they said at school, she's swinging. So I took her to the park and we sat on the swing to see what she do. You know, like you need to test this out. I don't take people's words for anything. And if they get her to do it, then it should be generalized at home. Meaning she can do it in all circumstances, not just there mm -hmm. with one particular person, you know? So I just, you know, I'll... I mean, <laughs> just do the best you can do, but find your child the services you can find. Find out what your state offers. Like um, that Florida respite list. Uh, don't find out about it when you had a diagnosis at two and you don't find out till they're seven. You want to get on the list at two. You know what I mean? Also, the cancellation list could be your best friend. So the, a lot of these appointments, developmental pediatrician, whatever, it'll be like a year out, you know, and my thing is get on the cancellation list and they'll call you if anybody canceled. And that's how we got ours quickly because mm -hmm. we went in when somebody canceled. So cancellation lists are key. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insight and your thoughts on everything. I really appreciate your time.